Dale, how are you, brother? Oh, I'm fantastic, mate. How are you? Yes, firing, mate. Firing. It's um, great to um, to chat. Uh, always good to chat to a fellow Royal Marine. Uh, but in this case, we've got a boxer, Jordan Reynolds. Hello, Jordan. Who came on the podcast the other day to thank for for putting you and I, you and I in touch. Yeah, what what and what a great lad Jordan is. I'm, I'm sure you had a blast with him. Yeah, we had a really good chat. He's so grounded. Um, he's, mate, he's he's super super switched on. I, like when when I first met him, I remember the first time I spoke to him, we were kind of doing some general work, and he was talk and he was talking about some like books he'd read, like kind of like personal development books and stuff like that. Um, and I was thinking, fucking hell, like this guy's like I think he was like seventeen or eighteen at the time. And he's like he's already thinking, you know probably where you know somewhere where i'd be thinking maybe 10 years in advance like you know he's well above kind of his well above his age at the time in terms of his thinking and his mindset i mean he's carried that all the way through his career like you know G- england gb and now now professional and he's going to go far definitely yeah you're a really nice bloke um hello again jordan yeah i remember i bought my first personal development book i think it was i was either coming from limpson to home or the other way around and was in exeter train station and had one of those cat book carousels. You don't sort of yeah. see them that much these days, but no. and there was one, one book, it was like how, I don't know, how to be the best you can be or something. And <laughs> I, 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 I mention it, mate, because why is it that some people have that? You know, they want to seek knowledge. I don't know. I think, it, I honestly believe it's, it's like internally driven. It's like, it's, I don't know whether it's like a, I always, a lot of times when I talk about things, I talk to my patients about things, I try and bring it back to like an evolutionary perspective. Like why, why, why do we behave in certain ways and how, how, how is, how does that relate to kind of evolution? And you can, it's obvious when you talk about kind of why people binge eat and stuff and how that, how they potentially an evolutionary aspect to that, you know, we, we didn't maybe have access to food for long periods of time when we come across carbohydrate, fatty foods, um, it'd be a good idea to, to, to take as much on as possible in order to store fat and carbohydrates in the muscle, and then we can go longer periods of time without food, for instance. So that you can understand it from that standpoint. But in terms in terms of uh, personal development, I think maybe it's about it's about um, trying to be the the best version of yourself. So you're the most you you're able to be the most useful person in terms of the community. Like humans are community species. Um, so even if even though I like to think I'm independent and stuff like. I, I, I do also want to be useful, right? I like I, I work in healthcare. I help people recover from pain and injury, get back to sport. So I think I think it comes down to that. I think it comes down to being capable um, and being able to um, handle situations that you, we maybe would have come across I- I- historically in our evolution. Um, and uh, and it's a survival mechanism. The most useful, capable person maybe attracts the best mate, maybe can fight off the lion, you know, get the food, all that type of stuff. So it is, I think it's an evolutionary drive. And I think some people, it's stronger in some people than it is in others. Um, and it seems to be quite strong in Boonex. <laughs> yeah. We're a, we're a rare breed, mate, aren't we? You know, um, it seems like, if, like you go, I, I, if you go online, like go on, go on Instagram or something like that. And the amount of Boonex that are doing, amazing stuff around the world is insane yeah like you, go, like you just you just you can just like you can't list them they're just like endless amounts of bootlegs that just just left the core and gone on to amazing things and um you know physical feats you know psychological stuff um you know, businesses whatever they've kind of decided to get stuck into um you know, they've, t- they've typically can have done done really well and, and i don't know whether it's once again it was an internally driven thing that you know that does does that type of service attract certain types of individuals initially who already have these traits or is there something about the training that allows for these traits to develop, especially if you, if you join at a younger age where you're more, more plastic and malleable, where you can be influenced. Um, and when you're around other people that are similar in nature and similar in kind of mindset, how does that influence your behaviors longer term? I think it's all interesting stuff. I don't know particularly the answers, but, there seems to be certain traits that, that Boonex have that, that is potentially an advantage um, longer term. Yes. And 
you just said something there. It, it's interesting, isn't it, that a lot of people will be surprised at this, but the average career of a Royal Marine is seven years. Yeah. Um, and I think you, it, 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 there's kind of like a split, not, not a physical split, but a metaphysical split of people that went in for the experience mm-hmm. and when they've had it, there's just other stuff they want to do in life, isn't there? And then you get your career. Yeah. You know, your professional career, soldier or marine. And um, you know, it's kind of like a different, different thing again. But I mean, there's Marines out there writing books, there's Marines hosting TV shows, um, and, and that's just this kind of st- stuff in the media. There's all also an awful awful lot of Marines just doing bloody good stuff that we don't get just just day-to-day stuff like you know even like you know like running charities doing stuff in the community i mean i've i've just like the amount of things that i see um they just pop up on my on my time like timelines or feeds and stuff and i think oh wrong that's amazing and i click onto it oh it's a a bit that wrong now um and then it's just it's just it's really inspiring but i think you're right i mean i always i always join for the experience um i was never going to be a you know, I, I never decided that I was going to do the, do it long term. I'm, if like if you if you kind of as you go through my history, you know, course of my life up until this point, you'll see that I'm very much an experience driven person. Like I want to do stuff that's hard, that's challenging, that's going to test me. Um, but I don't necessarily want to do that forever. I want to do something else. I want to find where where's that next point where I can be pushed whether that's physically, psychologically, emotionally, whatever it is. So I think there's certain bootnecks that, 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 that are like that as well. Um, I don't know whether it's like you know, some sort of ADHD issue. <laughs> um, can't, can't stay in one place too long, you know, get itchy feet or something like that. But um, there's certainly something there that in, in makes me kind of want to, okay, where's the next challenge? Where's something else I can get stuck into and get focused on? Yeah, definitely. And I think background for a lot of us um, – I think this might surprise people to know, but you know, so many people, so many of us come from quite damaged backgrounds mm. that it gives you a certain, you know, mind mindset and approach to life that I think you, you want answers. <laughs> and, yeah. It's, uh, it's interesting. Cause I think a lot of lads, like a lot of lads that I was in with, they didn't, they didn't really have anyone at home, like home, home. So like when they joined the court, that was their, that was their home. Like I was, I was very, I'm very fortunate to have, I had a really good upbringing. Like we weren't, we weren't wealthy or anything like that. We skimped, to be honest. Um, it was it, you know, we, money was tight when we grew up, but as we were a, like loving family to, uh, I had a mum and a mum and a dad, both living together. Um, we, we went to school every day. We, all of our needs were looked after. I had, I had three siblings. So we had lots of fun in the house. We like, it was a really happy house, busy house with friends coming around and stuff like that. Um, so my, my background wasn't damaged at all. I, 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 I come from the, what happened was I was, in, I was in the final year of school and I never had any ambition to join the, the armed forces up until this point. Mm-hmm. So I was, I was, I was 16 because I was a September baby and this was like Christmas time. And I was talking to one of my mates, brother's mates who was in, in, in the Royal Marines. He joined and just passed training, chatting to him. Also, I was kind of seeing all the stuff from the news with, with um, and the, the bootnecks were in the news, and I was like, it's really interesting. I went onto the website and started to like flick through, and there was I was looking at like some of the, like the like, and I knew about the Royal Marines. I'd been interested in them before, I'd seen other stuff, but I, ne- I never thought that I was going to join. Um, but I started to look through the website. And I was like, oh, this is really cool. And at the time, they were running the. Um, um, you 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 you've hit, hit your wall. Get over it. Do you remember the the the, the campaign on TV? The advert with like they're on the uh, on, on the the salt course, and they're like the guy gets to a wall and he's like struggling to get over it. And it's like you know, and, and then I think they, there's a, there was a bit where like you know on the endurance course going through Peter's pool. You know, is this is this when you, you know this is your breaking point type thing? Um, I was like, that looks really cool. Um, and so I, I looked at the, the requirements, and there was like the three mile test that you had to do on the PRMC. And I was like, I'm fit. I'm gonna, so I was training in terms of like, I was doing some weights. So I was 16 and I was playing football and rugby and all that type of stuff. I was like, let's go out and go for a run and see if I can do it. I never used to run just for running sake at that point. Mm. But I was like, I'm going to go and see if I can do it. <laughs> There's a half mile loop around my house. And I, I went out running and I was literally dying from the first like, 
you know, first first half a mile running and and but I ended up doing three miles and I just got in just in time. And I was like, ah, I have got in. I, I borderline had a had a cardiac event getting round. But I managed to get round and then uh then I was it and I decided I went and spoke to my mum. I was like, I'm joining the Royal Marine. She was like, she's like, no, you're not. I was like, she's like, I was like, no, no, I am joining the Royal Marine. She's like, you're joking, right? I was like, no, no, I'm I'm joining. She's like, no, you're not joining because I'm not going to sign sign the papers to join. I was like, well, if you don't sign the papers, I'll just sign them next year when I'm when I'm able to. Like you can sign them when you're 17, I believe, for a little bit at a time. So she was like, okay, and then we got to the nitty gritty and stuff. But I was I was really academic at school, so I like sailed through studying. Um, I was average physically, like I was okay. Like I played in the like football team, rugby team, stuff like that. Um, but I was never like super, super athletic. Like there was a lot more people that are more talented than me physically. Um, but I was really academic. That was I had good memory, so I was lucky to be able to retain information. And I got to, and I was like, all of my teachers and stuff were were um, <laughs> they were pushing me to go into university. So like everyone assumed that I was just going to go straight to university. We went. There was like this like gifted and talented scheme at school for all the people that were bright all the bright kids and then we got to go and visit loads of universities like Oxford, Cambridge, um, like Loughborough, if you were, if you were interested in sport, all this type of stuff. So I had all these visits to the universities and like I was being groomed to go to university and then I dropped dropped the hammer on them and said, no, 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 I'll join the Royal Marines. And I had this like, uh, I remember I had this like intervention <laughs> of teachers that brought me in and it was like just talking to me and just like trying to convince me not to join the Royal Marines, which is, which was out of madness, but, I still remember it. It's quite, it's quite a fond memory to be honest. Your story's so similar to mine. I was, um, I was homeless and living in my car at the time, and my mate did the PRC, or it was before, before they called it the PRMC. Yeah, or the PRC, and he went off to limit, and he came back, and he was buzzing, and he was firing, and he he'd had like I don't know, thirty guys rock up for this PRC, and 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 three of them passed or something. It was one of those. Uh, yeah. yeah, and uh, he said these immortal words to me. He went, "Yeah, it was tough, but of course you couldn't do it." I was like, "I fucking can." <laughs> so we'll see about that. <laughs> yeah, just like you, I looked at the brochures and I went, "I can do fifty press ups." Yeah, I can do eighty sit ups. I can. They want six pull ups. I can yeah. do like thirty pull ups. Right. So I set myself a, a challenge because I wasn't a runner either. And I ran around, there's a, a, a rock on Dartmoor called The Rock that some people might know. And it was half a mile from my home around the rock and back. And I thought, right, if I can run around the rock, sorry, it was a mile. If I can run this mile around the rock and back without stopping, bang, I'm going to go to the recruiting office on it was, it was actually Christmas Eve or something. And uh, <laughs> going to go to the recruiting office after the holiday. And I'll tell you what, it killed me. It killed me. I, I did that first half mile and I wanted to die. And there was this voice in my head and it just said, Chris, you've got two options here. You can give up and then you're just going to be giving up for life. Uh -huh, 100%. Or you can hang in there. And those recruiting office doors are going to be open for you. And right. that was it. It was, I'd say that's probably like my first epiphany in life. That Right. I, I speak to my patients about this all the time, right? About quitting. Um, lots of, it, it's, it's, it, might, it probably goes back to evolution as well. Like it, it's, it's when you're, you know, with, with, it's been so hard for humans throughout the, throughout our history that we, now and we've always seeks to have comfort right um so at at the moment when when we're in it sometimes now when, when we need to sort of dig in and we and we've made this comfortable life for ourselves in terms of you know sanitation it's safe education um you know we don't have to be particularly physical all this type of stuff the way, the way we've designed our lives so when things do get tough sometimes we struggle with it so i speak i speak to patients about all the time about quitting and and that actually no one no one knows that you quit right so if you if you if you if you try and do something if you go to do something and you quit for instance right if i was doing a race i could go out there and i could do the race um i could quit on course 
and I could post on social media that something was hurting me. I, I blew up, you know, there's nothing I could do about it. Um, but I might know that actually I didn't really fancy it that day. Or I could do the race, I could complete the race even. Um, but halfway around, I could slow, really slow myself down because it's hurting me a little bit and it's, you know, I'm, I'm struggling. Um, but actually I know that I've got more inside me, but I can just, I can just quit. Or, and, and, and in that situation, nobody would ever call you a quitter, right? You, you're, you're, you've, put, you've went and done what you were supposed to do. You've done the race, you've finished it. So you haven't quit as such, but you have, because you, you quit halfway around with yourself, right? When you, when you could have dug in a little bit and you you know, your goal might have been to dig in and push a bit harder and you, and you did not So I think, the the rally is about quitting is interesting is that sometimes it's maybe the right thing to do if you, in terms of if you change your mind really change your mind really that's not your goal anymore but in a lot of situations people typically quit when it gets hard and and unfortunately like although people don't really maybe don't know that you quit or you know they, they, they might be not aware that you quit you have to live with that like personally and i i, I feel like Every time that you are able to overcome those feelings of wanting to quit, you get a little bit stronger internally, right? Every, and, and, and what it does is over a period of time, if you say, for instance, it might be something as simple as I need, you know, I set my alarm in the morning for five o'clock um, and I snooze to six o'clock every morning. And actually I want to snooze, you know, I want to be up at five o'clock in the morning. And every time that you, keep snoozing and get up at six you chip you chip away at your ability to be be resilient later um you're chipping away at your your um it's almost like the trust in yourself to do certain things so you, and but every time you set an alarm you get up at five o'clock you're building confidence in yourself and your ability to do stuff um and that the the the, the sum of that and how that compounds over a period of time is it's amazing what 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 how it changes you as a person. So, um, yeah, unfortunately, with quitting, you 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 may be the only person that has to deal with it. It may not be an external face and thing, etc. But that internal feeling that you get can can eat people up. And I've seen you see you see a lot of people that have left the core that go back and go back and rejoin. Right? They they, they didn't pass training for whatever reason. Maybe they got injured. Maybe they um, had some issues um, with 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 some of the skills or whatever it was. And 10 years later, they've rejoined the core because it's all that period. And then every day for that period of time, it's been eating them up inside. And they want, and, and you see, see the same with, with boxers that, that they, you know, they kind of, you know, c- come back after a period of time. And, and it's like, it, it's this internal driver in, in, to, to want to achieve certain things. They feel like they, they could have done better and they want to get back into it type thing. But um, for me, I, I, I don't like living with the, the feeling of quitting. It's kind of, it's, it's kind of against my core values as a person, I think. Yes, I've only ever met one person um, who left the Marines and just said, Chris, I'm really glad I did. I'm, I'm not, f- friends at home, we're not trying to sell the military here. I'm, I'm just saying that most people tend to be, all right, Chris, yeah, I'll, I was in the Marines. I got to week 23 in training and I, and, and it just, it's eaten me up my whole life. And yeah, I say to everyone, well, I say to everyone, we, we had our 30 year reunion, our troop, and we went to Limston and they said, you want to go and speak to the fresh recruits in the, uh, they call it the foundation block. Now yeah. it was the induction block when I was, uh, when I was there. And um, so I stepped forward to these youngsters and I just said, listen, don't fucking quit. It's that simple. Unless you absolutely decide, no, actually, this isn't for me. I, I, I really don't want to. That's fine. That's fine because it's not the be all and end all to, to be in the military or get you know what? I fucking hated training. <laughs> I hated it. I, I was literally like, I was never going to quit, right? But only because I weren't going to quit on, quit on I, I was going to pass the course no matter what. It killed me in the process. I was going to, I was going to, I was going to pass the course. I hated it. It was like, I was, I joined when I was 16. Scrawny little 16 year old, skinny, 11 stone. I was fit. I was strong for my age. 
he started slapping on the burger on my back. My body started to break down. Right, I was super fussy eater. Um, I like I lost a load of weight in training because I, I was like I was getting up in the morning and I wasn't used to being up early in the morning. I couldn't eat, and then like I was going doing all this kind of all the stuff you do day to day. I was getting really fatigued and beaten up from it. All the admin stuff I'd been like I was fortunate like my mum my mum done loads of stuff at home. I was a kid still, so I was having to learn all this stuff. Um, and I enjoyed different bits of it, like like some of the like learning some of the soldiering skills and all that type of stuff. There's bits of the lads. But and I could see myself like the job, I could see it was like I quite liked it, but hated every minute of being at Limston. Hated it. Like and I was it was just I was, my body was just breaking down. Like I was I was and even to the point where week nine I got this real, real bad chest infection, ended up in the hospital on IV antibiotics. Um managed to do it was like gym pass out on a Saturday. Everyone done it on like Wednesday or something, but I missed it. And I managed to do it on Saturday and just like let me just like do the, the bare minimum on the bleep test and the pull-ups and stuff just to get through to the next week. Um, and then they, and then got to, we, well, to a commando test. Oh, well, and it's the thing. And at, at that point, all that mattered to me was getting that green lid, right? It was like, and I, and getting the green lid to me right now, single-handedly, the, the most proudest moment of my life to this point. Um, it's meant, it's just the, it's been the biggest thing because I'm, I realised how much it took for me in training to get it. Like, there's been nothing ever that, since then that's, that's challenged me like, like that. And I've done loads of stuff, um, but there's nothing that took so much from me um, like Royal Marines training because I've really found it tough. So I was in commander this week, woke up on Saturday, and I was and I've got like big chin, right? So I was I was looking, I was sort of half asleep, was sort of splashed my face. Um, when I went into the went into the heads to have a shave, and I got got in, got into the toilet. So I was like in the sink, and I was creamed up my face. I started shaving, and and like rather than like having like corners around like my chin, it was just like one smooth kind of circle all the way down to like my like chest. So I sort of like look, well, like rubbed my eyes, looked in the mirror, and I was like, "Fuck!" And my face had like was well, my neck was swollen like this. This was on the morning of the endurance course. And I was like, no. And what had happened was there was there was mumps going around in my hometown. And I'd gone back about maybe six weeks before or something like that. I don't know when that when I'd gone back, but I ended up I ended up coming out in coming out in mumps. And I had so I had to come do the commando test with mumps. And I did um I went down the endurance endurance course and I, I I set off in the second group of three. Right, so right in front, um, and as you know, as you go through the endurance, and so all the so if anyone doesn't know, the faster lads go at the front because otherwise, on the endurance course, you'll hold everyone up. So I set off in the se- second group of three, and you go through f- with a, in a group of three until you get to a place called uh, the sheep step where you dip each other under this kind of like water tunnel, and then you can go and do your own thing. So I started running this group of three, and the lads were going, Dale, hurry the fuck up, what are you doing? So and I was blowing. Like, I, I was struggling to keep up with them to, to the point that the groups behind us, but I believe, probably started a minute later, maybe. They they, they were catching up with us, right? Um, they're like, lad, Dale, what are you doing? What are you doing? Hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. Anyway, got to sheep sit, went through, they, and they ran off. And then I had to then, as I was an endurance course, had to watch person after person after person pass me on the way back. I was on, and I was blowing. I was, it, it, it I've never felt pain like it. I could hardly breathe when I was r- r- running, um, shuffling, whatever I was doing. And I got I got in and I was expected to get in in about 63 minutes, like based on like performance previously. And I believe it was like 73 minutes cutoff time we had. And I got I remember getting in, I was like, I failed this. Like so many people had come past me along along the course. I was like, am I the last person coming in? Like, they're, they're, like there was, I was like everyone was seemingly everyone had passed me. And I was just like, I'm just gonna keep going as hard as I can until I get there. And I got there, my PTI was there with the, with the kind of stopwatch. And he was like, fucking hell, Hardeman, where have you been? And I was like, I was like, oh. and he goes, right, well done anyway, good effort, over there, onto, onto the range sort of thing. Like, I was like, it was like it was 72 and a half minutes. So I got in by like half a minute, I think. So I lost, I lost maybe like nine and a half minutes just from, from being ill. And then, mm. then obviously that, then I done, I can't remember what, what order it is now. So is it is it the 
it's the nine mile speed march next, right? And then it's the yeah, isn't it Tarzan Assault on the Thursday, Endurance on the Friday, Nine Miler on the Saturday, and then we we definitely first, did the endurance. We first, definitely did the endurance first. Uh, okay. Because I remember waking up on the Saturday going, oh, that's how I remember it anyway. But anyway, we did, I went, I, when it was on, when I done the company, Tarzan was definitely after because I went, when I went and done the Tarzan, I remember my training team pulling me aside and saying, what, what the hell's gone? What's, what's going on? Like, I remember like, having a conversation with them. They sort of pulled me aside and said, what's going on? And they said, look, you, we can see you're ill. What's happening? So I said to them about the, the neck and mumps and stuff like that. They're like, yeah, they're like, what do you want? What do you want to do? Do you want to do you want to pull off, or do you want to do you want to carry on? And I was like, well, obviously I'm going to carry on. They're like, right, stay away from the lads in the showers. <laughs> That's how technical it got. Stay away from the lads in the showers. Um, you're doing this at your own risk, and I probably shouldn't say this, um, but you know, but. You're at, you're an adult. Make your own decisions right here, and that's what I fucking that's what I love about the core as well. It's like self responsibility. You know, you're an adult here. You you want to. In like one of my mates um, says it like he, he makes me laugh. He says, um, if you if you want to act the um, the big man at night, you have to also be able to willing to act, be willing to act the big man in the morning as well. So I think like you know you have to be able to deal with the consequences of your actions. You don't you know if something if I, I then end up giving myself a big problem that's my fault that's no one else's it's not on anyone else i made the choice anyway i, I end up doing it i got through got through a tarzan got through got through a test done the third mile but struggled like hell to get around um but i would, we got through and got my green lid and that and then obviously that meant a lot to me like that's still still the that whole air time period of my life is the, you know, that passing warmer training and then and getting my green bright still the, still the proudest moment definitely yeah my, my mine was passing the prc funny enough. <coughs> yeah you know coming from a you know challenging background uh, to actually achieve something of that what well, at the time to me is the holy grail it's just the, when they say pat yourselves on the back gentlemen you've just entered the royal marines and a load of lads have been sent off home because they'd failed the the the, the the PRC. I, I remember going back on the train. I was buzzing. I was absolutely. It was just. It still is to this day. Um, you know, just the most memorable moment uh, in my life. And Dale, uh, Afghanistan. How many times did you go there? Twice. I went in. I went with Charlie Company in two thousand and six. Um, we, so that's uh, f- 40 commando 40 commando mm-hmm. we were we went to Kabul uh, we were in Kabul for just shy of five months um, just as, just as a section uh, sorry as a as a, as a, a company a company group um, and and that was during Herrick would have been Herrick 3 so when the powers were in Sangin um, and you know, that was like a bit of bloody tour for them but we're, for us we were in uh, Kabul when it was kind of um, a lot of patrolling, you know, I, IED risk, uh, not a lot of small arms contact, and you know, it was it was when well, it did a little bit of like public order stuff. It wasn't it wasn't particularly like heavy compared to what we then experienced in two thousand and seven, two thousand eight, when we deployed as a as a as a group of. Um, well, 40 commander deployed um, with, I believe, the rifles, and uh, we weren't we weren't part of the brigade. We, the brigade we were deployed separately. Like I think up, you know, after us, so 40 commander were attached to someone else. Um, but I spent time in that. I spent seven months there in Afghanistan. Then we done. Um, I was in Nauzad, K- Kajaki, Sangin, um, all places that were pretty interesting um pretty hairy live there was a lot of contact um a lot, you know it was there was war fighting going on there wasn't a lot of locals around there was a lot of taliban um it was kind of like some ied risk uh but a lot of like small arms um rpgs you know like all the you know indirect, some indirect fire some 7s uh, all this sort of proper fighting stuff 
um, that went on that tour. So it was a bit of a different tour, but um, yeah, yeah, twice overall. It's um, pretty beautiful up by Kajaki, is it? Is it not? Absolutely amazing, mm. <laughs> stunning. You've got these. So there's there's the Kajaki. You got the, you basically got a dam there, um, and it's like really like mountainous and hilly. Um, but you've got a couple of like observation points kind of um, in the, in the in the hilly bit that overlooks Kajaki Town, um, and then you've got the the Kajaki. I don't know what they call it now. DC, they'd probably call it a FOB, maybe. I can't remember what they called it. Or, or DC or something. You've got the Kajaki main camp type sort of thing just, just below. Um, but you have these kind of fast support positions that overlook everything. Um, and you could, with, in Kajaki, what you could do is because the lads had eyes on that whole area, you could, you which was, and now I think about it, it's mad. You could leave the camp on your own, right, with a weapon, and then go up to the fire support positions, right? So as long as you had kit with you, burden weapons. So I was at the time, me and my me and my she's my wife now, mother of my children, but she was my girlfriend at the time. We'd split up. So I started training to for SF selection. So I was just going up and doing loops of this like um like circuit type thing, up into the hills, back down, up to the back down, and just checking them with the lats. But I kind of like think back, I think oh, that's a bit risky, really. <laughs> like you know anything anything could have gone wrong wrong there uh, I've done it and but it was quite lads were doing it but there was the main the main risk from the enemy was kind of to the north so like we'd have to push into that to to get to get in, get in contacts and stuff so it would I don't think there was much risk locally but there could have been you know <laughs> someone could have snuck in you know all sorts of stuff it, it, it didn't happen that way but um, or it could have been someone could, you know, I could have been sh- shot at when I was doing that, but it, it never happened that way. So, um, but yeah, Kajaki's insane, like absolutely stunning, beautiful. We could even go like a couple of times, go swimming in the dam a little bit um, and like freezing cold water, but absolutely stunning. Amazing. Sounds incredible. We had a, a the chap I shared a, my room with in Northern, in the Northern Ireland or our tour of Northern Ireland was called Dave. Uh, killed himself, Dave did. Another another sad military statistic. Um, but what he used to do, he started, um, I was going to say knocking off then, and I forget that I can't, can't use such terms when you're 52. He started to have liaisons with a girl in the naffy. Yeah. And um, because he was a section commander or 2IC, he had a radio and he used to just tuck it in his jacket, hop in the boot of her car. She'd lock him in the boot and he'd drive out of camp and he'd go and spend the night at her place. That might not sound much to people listening, but Risky. when you're in that camp, every single minute of every day, you're waiting to be killed. You know, we got mortared. We, we got the back gate bombs. Uh, we got um, sniped at going out the front gate. And you know yourself, you know, if the Taliban had ever got hold of you, it, it yeah. wouldn't be pretty. And in, it's the same in our, our, our Ireland. If the IRA had got hold of a, a Marine, that wasn't going to end very, very well. And uh, yeah, Dave, <laughs> he didn't give a shit. I thought it was one of the bravest things I've ever seen. He just, yeah, he, he just, fucking, he could have he been. Big trouble there. Yeah. Uh, oh my god. Yeah, well, he would have been like probably dismissed if anyone had found out. Well, uh, not even that. I mean, that's 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 the least of that would have been the least well, of your worries. You don't you don't you don't want to get you know caught yeah. by the like, IRA in someone's someone's house when you're a British soldier at that at that point in time. It's just the same same thing. You know, the, we were actually like oh like we I had permission to go up right. You kind of like it was fine, but even then it was brutally risky. I just but he's just like. Um, I think the reason why the mil- the mil- military works um, is that you've got young, young, fit, strong males that are that aren't risk averse. <laughs> um, yeah. their, their tolerance to risk is you know is low. I mean, they're like mm-hmm. like oh, sorry, sorry, hi. They don't mind, don't mind, don't mind risk. It's you know, it's one of those inherently risky careers, right? Um, it probably explains like some other stuff I've done, like you know, combat sports and stuff. Like 
I'm, I'm willing to physically take risks. But I think I probably changed a little bit since having kids, actually. Yes, it does. It does make you uh, reassess. Complete, completely changes the. Yeah, just like, yeah, you know, when when it's just you, you yeah. You know, I, I didn't really think of any of the behaviours as risky as such. I just didn't really, I never really thought about. It. I just kind of done them and enjoyed them and stuff and did things. But when you when you have children, I think now like do do I really want to go down the gym and get punched in the head every day? You know, is that, is that, you know, I obviously want to be kind of be able to have a conversation when I get older, but also as well, like I want to be around for my children, right? Like I don't, I don't want something to happen. I watched um, one of the lads from my gym. He wasn't like a good buddy of mine or anything like that, but he was good mates with some of my training partners. Went to watch him fight. Um, I was literally right outside the ring, like literally. And he, he's in this, in this absolute war with this guy. The guy's a monster and the guy ends up there uh, landing like a big right hand and then left hook knocks out knocks out um, our training partner he just didn't get up he just like he was on, on the canvas and he was just like boom like come was like lifeless and I was like thinking fuck that was terrible like bad and I've seen knockouts loads of knockouts right and this this was I was like right next to it it was just in front of me I was like always on like a stage like the kind of the VRP seat so I was like on the seat looking right next to it and it happened just in front of me and he's like I was thinking I was looking around at the lads and I was thinking fuck he, he's not getting up and anyway the ambulance was in there and they were trying to re- revive him he was, he was down for about 30 minutes on, on the floor and then he gets you know, get the spinal board out bring him the ambulance uh, to hospital he ended up he ended up having like a huge bleed in the brain um, they managed to save his life but he's now <sighs> physically unable to do most things yeah. psychologically unable to he's like he's kind of he's at his mental age is kind of like a bit of a young child type thing now he's like he, he'll have to rely on care for the rest of his life um and that's from doing a sport that he loved and we you know we are aware of the risk but since having kids i'm like do i want to do that even like even with cycling right there's nothing that pisses me off more i'll go i'll go out and cycle i love cycling um, it's part, you know, part of the sport I do at the moment and but you go out on the road and it is brutal out there right you are it is it is kind of a numbers game out there like the drivers are reckless they they and they don't realise how close they are to killing you every time they do something stupid right and I've seen loads I know loads of lads that have been seriously injured from cycling and people have died and stuff and I'm, and I'm out on the road and going, just going for a Sunday long ride, do you know what I mean? Just a casual ride. And some lunatic tries to take me out. I'm thinking, and, and, and then they try and blame you. Like you've done, like, and they don't give you the risk. It's like, so even that, like I, I, I do a lot of my cycling now indoors, like on turbo train. And I, I typically go out maybe once a week or once every two weeks, just because I'm not, I'm not looking to get taken out by some knobhead, knobhead in the car. Yeah, yeah. Just, yeah. And they also, do. And like, I don't get road rage in the car, but when I'm on my bike, I get pretty angry pretty quick. I just, I just can't help myself because I know that they're, you know, if I'm in the car, someone does something stupid, we have a little collision. It might not be, the, you know, it might not be that bad, right? Someone climbs onto the bike. I know that it's serious, so it could potentially be very serious. So I get angry quick on the bike. Mm. Um, and everyone's probably thinking, shut up, mate, you're wearing Lycra, go, you know, but I'm like, no, if you want to pull over your car, we'll have, we'll have the proper discussion. They do this thing, I, I don't know if this is countrywide, but they do it down here. The, the drivers are afraid to cross the white line. E- even when there's like nothing coming in the opposite direction, they, they see it as like their mission is they've got to squeeze past you on the bike but not go over the white line. Like, and, and it's, 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 it makes you wonder how, you know, how people can be that stupid. But people, it, it, I've, I put something on my social media the other day saying that they should make every driver about once every two to three years cycle 10 miles on a bike along the road just so they know what it feels like to be on a bike. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like, make, expose everyone to it. Like, so that, I mean, obviously it will never happen, but is it in my little, my little fantasy world? 
that would be the best thing. Put the fear, put the fear into them. That they understand that when you're on a bike, you feel extremely exposed, right? Like there's p- cars coming past you and like cars pull out and stuff all the time. Like the other day I was, I was literally in the aero position. I must be going about 25 mile an hour. I was on, I was kind of like middle-ish of my, of my lane going through, going through a place called Henlo. There's cars parked up on the, on the, on the right-hand side of me. And this lorry, right, has come out into, onto my side because there's p- cars parked on his side of the road. And he's heading to me head on. Like, all I can see is this coming towards me. Like, like and I've had to like swerve, like ba- barely got out of the aero position. I still had one arm in the aero bar. I've grabbed my hand bar. I've gone like this. Um, almost hit the curb. And I'm pretty sure he didn't even see me. No. I'm, 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 I don't know if he saw me or not. And I was just like, then I just like sat up and I slowed down for about half an hour. I was just like, what the fuck is like, this? Like, I almost, almost died there. Like, like, there was like a head on collision with this lunatic in the lorry. He's just not paying attention. Or, I'm not, I don't know whether he saw, I don't know whether he saw me or not. I've got no idea. Mm. It, I don't think he did, but it, I suppose it doesn't help being in the aero position. You're a bit smaller, but, and you're moving maybe a bit faster than what people would expect a cyclist to move. But at the same point in time, it's like, come on, mate, open your eyes and look. So it's, it's, it is brutal. Yeah, they should fit a device to all uh, drivers that if you come within five metres of a cyclist, you get a 90 million volt shock yeah, yeah. to your balls <laughs> or your bits. <laughs> that would stop these fuckers. <laughs> Mate, they're, fuck- they're roof- they're, they're, it's happened. It's only happened three times, right? I don't know what why people think this is a good idea, right? So, and the interesting thing, it's happened twice on one night. So one night last summer, I was going out and I was cycling around the local lanes and on, on my bike, I was on my road bike, having a good time cycling. It's beautiful weather. It's about half seven in the evening. And some, some knobheads, two, two young lads in the car, as they're driving past to overtake me, they've like screamed at me to try and spook me. So I've gone like this, right, on my bike. because so I'm like, whoa, what the hell's that? And then they're laughing and they drove. Anyway, I tried my best to catch up with them and they, and they were gone, right? About 20 minutes later, it happened again. And I was like, what, what are people drinking tonight? And it was, I believe it was in the, um, it was, I think it was in the, maybe in the World Cup. It was the World Cup last year. Oh, mate, now you're asking. I've, uh, yeah, well, it was, well, wasn't it? Was, maybe it was the World Cup time, maybe last year or the year before, whatever it was. But it might be, it was around that sort of time because there was quite, quite a few people in pubs and stuff or maybe the weather was really nice I can't really remember but it happened twice in one night and then it happened again about two weeks ago but this time it was a guy on a moped right so this guy on a moped has come part is 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 is, is, is overtook me and he's like ah, and shouted like to try and spook me but I didn't really react I sort of looked but he's on a moped you can only go 30 mile an hour right so or 40 mile an hour you can't go that fast and I was like why have you just done that so I, I started bombing it on my cycle to, to bike to catch it. So I was like, you, 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 you know, and I was so, I was so angry. I've, I've actually not had a fist fight in like, in, in normal life, civilian life type thing. I've obviously done competitive stuff, but since I was a kid, right. Since I was like 18 or whatever, but I'm angry right now. Right. And this, and, and, and this guy is going, I'm so angry. I can see in my head visions of me, booting him off his bike and, uh, as I catch him. Um, just so he understands that there's consequences to actions. I think that's another thing Like people think they can get away with stuff like this because there isn't inherently any consequence to doing stuff like that normally. People just let it slide. If people didn't let it slide, people would understand, actually, I shouldn't do stuff like that to people. You know, but the way I saw it was, you, okay, in your head, you, you're, only, you're only shouting at me, right? You're only shouting something at me. In my head is, your shouting could cause me to crash, which could kill me. I've got children. Mm. So, and you could potentially really impact their lives. That's, that's how I'm seeing it. So it's super personal for me. Like, anyway, I, he, he just about managed to get away. Um, I got caught up behind some traffic that was moving slow. Couldn't get past it. And he disappeared off into the distance down this hill. It took me about, probably about five minutes for my blood pressure to come back down when I carried on cycling. But like the, it's just I just don't understand some people it's just pretty, Mate, <laughs> really madness we're going to call you Ronnie Pickering yeah <laughs> have you yeah, seen you know that I've, 
Have you I've, seen I've, that bitch? No, I haven't seen it. No, no. Oh, mate, get on YouTube, Ronnie Pickering. Bless you, Ronnie, if you ever get the chance to uh, watch this for some yeah, random, random like reason. Super chilled, right? Like all this, I'm like really relaxed person. Like, like takes. I, I I would I would very rarely get angry at anything that's, that's done to me, and I think the the only the, the big change is where I feel like something's going to impact my children. That's what's yeah. changed. So previously, if that happened to me. I would just laugh and probably like give them a little finger and say, go away, mate. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, I just think it's probably, probably think it's quite funny, like, nice try, whatever. But since, like, since having children, like, I just think that I, everything, I don't know whether it's like, it's not even like a conscious thing. It's just straight away, I'm like, that's, that's personal to me now because I feel like that could potentially impact my children's life. So, and it's just, it's just, uh, it's crazy how your physiology can influence and take over. Yeah, Halford should start selling um, Milan anti-tank missiles that you can fit on your handlebars. <laughs> that would sort it all out, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, if, uh, I mean, even like I don't know, like some sort of like slingshot type device on the aero bars would do. I could aim that towards them and then pull it, pull it back. That would that that would be enough. To, you know, I could aim it at, at his at his stupid pea head. I would have I would have got him, but. Um, yeah, I just don't understand people sometimes. But it's, yeah, so I, I mean, even even with all my training, I just try not to spend that much time on the road. One, for for my own health and safety and probably now after this discussion for other people's health and safety as well. <laughs> yeah, best thing, get up five in the morning and go before everyone else is awake. It's, it's 100%. Yeah. 100%. That's what good, I good blast then. Um, back to Afghanistan, Dale. What, did, did you have any memorable contacts? Yeah. I've said I've asked this question to some people on the podcast, and they were like, "Yeah, like every single day." <laughs> yeah, we had a lot. Yeah, I mean, I think the so when I was in Kajaki, I was um, I was on uh, mortar line, so we were sort of semi protected, right? We were within the within the um, within the kind of compound um but the lads would be getting the lads in kajaki would be getting in contact all the time um and we we as, as a mortar more line we fought we fired so many rounds we five our mortar line bear in mind there's probably 13 of us on the line fired about thirty thousand rounds in, in in the um in the uh, in the tour which was a lot of rounds and they brought they brought in these kind of air burst rounds um on that tour um, which we were using, and there was so many, so many contacts. But when I went to when I went to Sangin, my role was uh, I was attached to a, a section in Bravo Company um, on the ground with them, and I was uh, doing the sixty millimeter handheld role. Um, so we were we were in some some he- a few quite a few hairy moments. I mean, uh, did any of them stand out? I mean, the, the the thing I have the most the most memory of. Um, because there were some hairy moments, of course, but the thing I have the biggest memory of is we were, it was the first time that, like, so I'd fired towards people before, right? I never, like, n- like knew that any of my rounds had killed anyone, right? Had took, um, like, I knew that we'd, you know, as, you know we'd, we were in contact and stuff and fired towards people, but I never knew, thought that my rounds knew or, I didn't know, right? So um, I knew on the I knew on the mortar line as, as a collective, we we had many confirmed kills as a, a, a mortar line because it would get reported over the ICOM scan, scanner after we 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 contact uh, after we'd been in contact. I mean, we we're in huge contacts. But then when I was when I went on this, um, I was in I was in Sangin, and we'd go out on these patrols, we'd get in contact and stuff like that. But one day we was in the um, we was in the Sangin DC. And we started getting some some indirect fire 107 millimeter rockets, and there was like there's like this kind of like big building in San DC that's like used as fire sort of for, some fire support position, and the the tankies that are up in the fire port, support position could see the guy that was um, that was firing the rockets. It was in this kind of tree line. They could see him, but they couldn't engage him. He was a bit too far away. So they got got onto us on the radio, and it was basically me and another another lad, and we were. We did, there wasn't a uh, 81 millimeter mortar barrel 
in in Sangin. Um, there was a there was a section in in Inkerman which was a little bit further away, uh, maybe five k north of Sangin, but there was nothing in Sangin. So we just had this handheld. I remember the lads like basically just giving us like a kind of general direction where the guy was. We fought. So I, I, on my own, ended up firing this kind of 60 millimeter handheld over over a, um, I couldn't see the guy because there's a compound wall in between, but in the direction of the tree line which they gave me. So we got kind of like, he you know, gave, gave us a distance and I put the charges on the, on the, on the round and, and, and fired it. And we, we, we just, just missed him. But then they gave me a slight adjustment. And bearing in mind, I'm like, it's a barrel that you're holding like this, right? Like, so you're sort of, you control the elevation and the, the, the kind of direction of it. And the, you know, you make a correction that you might not be as accurate as you think it, you know, it's not like on, on the site on the, on the 81 where you can make smaller corrections. It's, it'll be more accurate. I think so. Anyway, so I fired the second round and, it, and it's take, it's, um, it took, anyway, it took this guy out, airburst round, um, took him out and confirmed. And, um, yeah, I just remember like that was the first time that like, I'd ever had that single me responsible for that, if that makes sense. Mm. Like rather than it being like a collective, like people firing towards someone or like the mortar line. Um, you know, you, I was a member of, of the mortar line. I was on the barrel, you know, I was either putting the, put a number two or a number one, whatever it is. It was just, it was just like, I remember thinking like as, it was just like a, and it was everyone lads were like the, the tankies like buzzing down the radio, like, oh, like yeah, you know, you know we've hit him, like, I couldn't believe it sort of thing. Um, and I remember thinking, like, oh, it's just, it was just like a weird feeling it was. It was just like, fuck. <laughs> um, um, it felt, you know, it felt kind of good, but not good. It was just, it was just a weird feeling um, to feel. Do you have any like difference of feeling now that you're, can we say, older and wiser or? or- um, I mean, it's it's. I guess what I'm getting at is a big thing in it to kill someone, and and I've I've said this to lads, not on the podcast, but lads that I know, I, I've seen them really battling like PTSD, and I'm yeah, and, and I, I it's, weird. I it's, it's weird. I think <coughs> no, I'll, I'll, I'll say, sorry, I'll, I'll just. The, Dale, the point I was making, I've said to these lads, listen, you know, it, it, you, you leave the past behind, it was a conflict, da, 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 you did. and they're like, oh, no, Chris, I won't bother about killing the enemy. Yeah. I, I, fucking fuck them. I was bothered that my mate died, and I'm like, oh, because I'm a sort of, yeah. you know, humanitarian. I, I think everyone's equal, and we shouldn't be fucking killing yeah. anyone, but... but Yeah, I'll, I'm, I'm, I'm the same. I think I... I, I yeah, I think like for for, I think that a lot of the lads that I I know with, that have had uh, issues with PTSD and stuff, it's kind of like a feeling of almost like some people would say like it's feeling like they felt like maybe they could have done something right. Um, mm. Someone died and maybe they could have influenced the the outcome. Uh, one of their mates died, like, well, but really the situation is it's you're in a war fighting situation. There's not much you could you know maybe you could have made different decisions and stuff, but it's like you're in, it's in real contact. Like it's, and it's not a night, you know, that's not a nice burden to carry, but I don't, I don't have anything like that. In terms of the, the killing of people, I think I'm kind of like a little bit like, I, it depends on like, it depends on once again, I don't think anyone should really die, but I think it, it depends on the context of it. All right. So it's like, there's, there's set, like you're in, you're, you're there, doing a job right and someone and he and they're firing towards you you're fine you're just kind of defending yourself um it's almost it was almost it was self-defense you know in in, in that in that situation yeah right? he's firing, firing into the camp there's other people at risk um and it just it it doesn't weigh on me quite the way it would if it was like i don't know like if say for instance i went on a night out and um yeah, so, like I, I wouldn't I wouldn't fight on a night out but when on a night out and um, I, I'd end up punching someone and killed them it, that would weigh on me a lot more that makes sense because yeah. you feel like because I'd feel like in that situation that person's probably not a qu- like people everyone, everyone thinks they're a bit tough on a night out but after a few beers but the reality of the situation I know from being a combat sports background um, 
been doing you know fighting with professional professional fighters for years that the average person is ill-equipped to combat on the street so they're they're confident um but they're they're compromised in terms of their ability to, to fight back so um so me you know hitting some drunk person on the light out and that would that that would be against the way you know the way i would value you know, my values in, in the first place but if something then seriously happens to that person that would really weigh heavy on me that would that wouldn't that wouldn't be a nice thing to live with because you just know that that person is kind of even though they've been a bit of a twat they're just they're a sitting duck right they're easy easy target um where and uh, but then again if you know if say for instance if something happened and you would try like you're surrounded by people and it was like you for whatever reason you're thinking shit like, i'm in trouble here like yeah you know, i could potentially get seriously hurt here and then then if something happens and you seriously hurt someone once again it's like that like it's it's almost internal to to for humans to try and survive right um and once again i'm thinking about that you know now like in in turn inside of me it's like i've got children etc so maybe in that situation if it was yeah i wouldn't feel as bad it depends i think it's all it's all context based yes yes exactly of course it is and um the powers that be, if we can call them that, have got a responsibility to a duty of care over the military. And uh, I think that's been abused in the last 20 years. But that's another that's another that's another road that we don't need to go down for this podcast, because I'm really fascinated, um, Dale, to chat about your Iron Man stuff. But before yeah. we do, did, did, shall we just give Chris Harrison a mention? Yeah, so Chris Chris Harrison was uh, was like my like closest mate when I was when I was in the Royal Marines. Um, he was in my mortar section. Um, we he he you know we spent a lot of time together on the piss um, uh, for a good few years together as, as good mates. And when I left in two thousand and nine, um, in fact, like just just so in two thousand nine I left and to. Uh, early 2010, just before Chris was deployed to Afghanistan, we actually went out on the piss, just me and him in Watford. Um, and then he went on tour. And then I was, I was sat at home one day and um, I get a phone call from from one of the lads, a guy called Neil. And I was looking at my phone thinking, like, what, why the fuck is Neil ringing me? Like, but I haven't spoken to him in ages. Like, and I just knew straight away. I was just like looking at the phone, dreading answering the phone, thinking, "Fuck!" Like, this, he's not ringing me for a good reason. I was like, "Neil, what's up?" He's like, uh, "Yeah, uh, Dale, I've got some bad news." I was like, "What's what's what's the news, mate?" And he's like, "It's Chris." And I was just like, "Fuck it!" You know? I was just like, knew I knew that it weren't going to be like uh, like he's like he's just lost a limb or something. Like that. And that sounds like trivial, right? That sounds like just because, but because I've seen so many lads that have done that and they've been around them and stuff. I knew it was good. It just, by the time of his voice, I could tell that it was like, it was like, it was not, it was more serious. Right. Mm. He's like, mate, Chris, Chris yesterday, um, yesterday was blown up um, in Sang and he died. He basically died in, in the arms of one of the lads. And I was just like, fuck so it was just it was, and and then obviously we then he, he was brought back and went to a funeral and he left like his his uh, wife behind and the year before I, I, me and the lads were at his wedding um, and just like and I, I left at that point and it kind of pushed like pushed me away from military stuff for a long period of time maybe about five years or something where I just was like do you know what I just want to park that and not have to deal with any of that mm. stuff. Um, and it weren't until like a few years later I could start still with it. In fact, like I'm not really like a grave visitor, if that makes sense. Like I don't like so, so like Chris, I went obviously went to the funeral and all that type of stuff, but then just I'm, I'm not the sort of person to go and visit graves. And I didn't for a while um, until more more rec- more recently, a few years ago, where I started to visit his grave more regularly. Um just because I probably had other stuff myself I had to deal with, right? Um, and it's just like for me, it's just not going. I don't know. It just it's going to these places don't 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 seem to help me. It's the same with my with my old man. My old man passed away a few years ago. Like going to going to his grave doesn't seem to help me that much. 
it, it just I don't know I just don't get and uh, I don't get some people get stuff out of that I just don't I just think I don't get a lot out of it so although I do go and visit of course but I just don't go as frequently as like many many people would do because it's just I don't know for me it's just uh, his memories there and you know if I want to kind of like have some sort of internal conversation with him I kind of do it myself in my own sort of time and um, I don't need to be in that sort of uh, thing but yeah Chris Harrison literally anyone that knew Chris would he was the one of the nicest guys you ever meet really larger than life character um epic on a night out um he used to do this thing called an atomic lunge on the dance floor like he'd know he was known for it big larger than life guy really big guy um carried at least a bit of muscle mass he had a real big presence um and he was like one of the, like the he was a great boot neck um uh, and he was definitely he's definitely been sorely missed by everyone that, that knew him 100 percent yeah, God bless you, Chris. Um, yes, funny in it, we join up for that job and that's part and parcel yeah. of it and yet you don't even think about that, do you, when you when you serve? Yeah, it's just, and, and I'm now being a bit older, like, it's kind of, I mean, I left the court behind many years ago. I left in 2009 um, and, you know, 2022 now. So Chris died in 2010. Like, but at the time, like, I, Chris was 25, I believe, when he passed away. And I, and I was younger at the time. And I kind of, you know, seen him as kind of like, almost like a big brother type thing. Um, like, you know, super close. And um, it was like, it was like, it's like losing a family member, basically. Mm. So exactly the same as like losing, losing someone who you were super close with. Like, is it, that to me, that was the most like significant trauma death that I'd ever had to deal with basically the closest person to me that I've ever had um, dying at that point and my dad's died later but there's also like a different feeling like it's like like losing Chris was like losing the brother then you lose, losing your parents different type of thing it's it's kind of like they have different you have different emotions attached to them and stuff but he um, yeah he was, a, he, was a, he was a great guy but I just remember thinking like, like I'm going back to it now like I remember thinking he was like, he was 25, he was a few years old, a couple of years older than me at the time, or a few years older than me at the time. Um, I remember thinking like, like, because I was young, he was older type thing, if that makes sense. Now I look back and I'm thinking, fuck man, like, he's 25, right? He's a 25 year old that lost his life in Afghanistan, like, what, what, what what's, what's the, you know, that's just such a waste of a, a life, especially of someone, like a life that's so vibrant. Um, so it had so much energy honestly like anyone that meet him or met him or meet would meet him would say the exact same thing larger life personality like literally brought energy to every room like and if you know bootnecks are known for their ability to um be eat cheerful, cray- eat cheerful yeah but in in and, and in shit situations um but also they could drip a little bit too but like chris was like literally um Mate, like in terms of morale, if you're looking for morale, Chris Chris would provide it. He was just that fucking guy. Yes, big respect, Chris. So, Dale, tell me, um, what came first then? The MMA, the the mixed martial arts fighting, or or triathlon? Um, MMA came first. Um, although you know I've done elements of triathlon and stuff previously but not like triathlon um, I've you know run cycle stuff like that but MMA came first like when, I le- when I left the core uh, I needed something that basically was going to keep me I wanted to do something that was hard that would keep me engaged with training and keep me super fit and healthy because you build up all this strength and I was always into my fit so I'd always like when I was in the core I'd be training two three times a day every day uh, we'd have the, the opportunity to, so why not? I'd like, make use of the time to train. So I was super fit, super strong. Um, and I was like, I need something to keep me fit and along that path. So I started doing mixed martial arts. And I've done a little bit of combat sports before, but as as I started going to classes and I started getting like, like I'm enjoying this, I go more and more and more. I just, I just like training. So I was just training like a lot. Um, started getting pretty good then my coach was oh you should do some amateur competition did that and he's like oh you should do some professional competition and all of a sudden I'm fighting in arenas it was a like it was mad really um I never had any plans to compete and all of a sudden I was fighting in front of thousands of people so it was cool 
um, I enjoyed it. But then triathlons come a little bit later. Like so, in terms of like triathlon, I had a um, in after having my children, I kind of like having children. Like I had like this period of time. But in fact, I circle back a little bit. I started my business. When I started my business, I kind of was so busy like building the business initially. Like I was working like stupid hours. I was only doing a little bit of training. And I've always trained like all the time. Like, I train every day normally. And, and I started my business and I, I went from like training every day to training like two, three times a week, just ticking over. And, I, and then my, when, and, but I was still, I was still fit and healthy and strong. But then when my kids come along, like first my son, sleep went out the window. Like it was carnage for like a year or something like that. And my training went phew, massively downhill. Um, and then my daughter came along as there's two of them. And I was like, I need something to, to, get me back get me back motivated training again like it's falling apart like i was i've, I've got an inflammatory joint condition called psoriatic arthritis that started flaring up bad like i'd put on weight um it's pissing me off i was getting like down um you know I, i'm not the sort of person like I, i've usually used exercise to control kind of my emotions my weight my health all that type of stuff and i wasn't i was getting well frustrated because i couldn't i wasn't doing it so i was like you know what i'm just gonna i'm just gonna book an iron man I'm going to start training for it. And then, so, so I booked the Ironman, started to train, and that's what got, that's what got me into triathlon. Like, but to circle back a little bit before that, in 2013, I had this, like, major hip surgery from, a, from an injury that I had in, um, from combat sports. So I ended up having some bone taken out of my hip, a load of cartilage removed, um, part of the labour removed, and, out and end up start, starting to rehab it. It's what put it what's what put my MMA career to an end, really, because I had the surgery and then it took me about two years to fully rehab it to the point where I was like comfortable doing a lot of the stuff. And at that point, I was busy with work and business, and I was just like, I don't. It's it was just hard to get back into it at that level. Like I missed like everyone that I was here with was here now, right? So it was it was hard to play catch up, and I couldn't. Because I was competing at the top of like Europe and, and UK MMA on like the big shows, I couldn't. There was no like place for me just to insert back into fighting some some people that were, weren't experienced. So I was going to come back and fight on bigger shows against bigger opponents, and I just weren't ready for it. So I just parked that. Um, and, and at the time, I remember my surgeon telling me like that I, I like I shouldn't be doing combat sports anyway. Um, but I carried on doing it. But he also said to me, like, to never run again. He basically said, your hips, he's like, look, look, look at this image. Your hips like an eight-year-old's hip. Like, there's no, there's no, you know, we took basically taken out all of the, or, you know, most of the cartilage on the acetabular surface. The labor was removed. You need to be doing low impact stuff, not running. Um, I was like, look, I want to run. He's like, we're one of the main reasons they had the surgery so I can get back to doing all this type of stuff. What are you talking about? He's like, no, no, no. It's like when we went in there, it was a lot worse than what, what we thought it was um, on the MRI. We couldn't see some of this stuff on the MRI. It looked worse when we went in there. We had to take more cartilage out. And I was like, fuck. Fortunately, I'm in the, I was in the right profession, you know, in terms of like um, I do, what I do every, every day is help people recover from pain, injury, rehab and stuff. So I started just to rehab myself. Um, and yeah, fortunately, I didn't take the surgeon's advice and to get, to get anyone's advice on it. I just, just I knew what my body was I knew what my body was about. I knew what I could do. I knew professionally what I did with people previously and seeing how they recover and stuff like that. So I knew that there was there was more variables at play. And anyway, yeah, I've been able to get back and do some really good stuff since then. Yeah, good stuff. We could talk about the alternative uh, side of therapy for ages. I don't know if you noticed, but I'm always like shifting in my seat. It's because my back's, excuse my French folks, it's fucked. Um but uh, so, yeah, I have an avid interest. I'm trying to avoid uh, surgery at the moment. Um, t- Dale, tell me, it's a big old thing to step into a, is it a cage in MMA? It's a cage fighting, right? Yeah. That's a, did you, did you see the, um, that series Kingdom? Uh, no. Oh, mate, you're missing a trick. It's about what these. Uh, it's about these cage fighters in um, uh, uh, Los Angeles, like right in the heart of that fighting scene. Yeah. Um, it was about, uh, I think it ran for two series. I, 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 it doesn't really matter, but 
it was bloody brilliant. It was just brilliant. Yes. It was all into, you know, it wasn't just about fighting, it was about their personal lives, about their party, and they're all like mad party heads. And and um, it was just, you know, all the wearing the bin bags in the sauna and all this yeah. stuff. And, and it's, it was, it's interesting because, I mean, that, that sounds epic. And I have obviously been in that, been in that sport. I have, you know, I've been around that sport for a long time and know lots of fighters competing at a very high level myself. Um, so I'm very like desensitized to all of it, if that makes sense. Like mm. people look at fighters and be like, oh, fuck, like, like they put them on this kind of pedestal. Like, oh man, this guy's like beast, you know, he's like, and, but I just got, I, I just look at them as normal. I don't even, I know so many fighters and I work with them professionally now in terms of helping them recover from injuries. Um, and these people are literally killers. Like they're so physically talented, like with, with their ability to do combat. But because I'm like, because I've been around it for so long, I'm so desensitized to it. It's just like, it's all like normal behavior to me. Um, like, so people, you know, you know, you know, drastic weight cuts, saunas, all of I mean, some fighters are wild, I mean, they're literally, I mean, they're just, they've got that personality type that's just, enables them to go and fight people right um, and uh, most people would think well that's a bit, bit crazy I ain't going to go in there one on one with someone who's trained to fight and go and fight them it's a bit like why would you do that right it, it's like it's, it just doesn't really make that much sense but you have to have something some sort of element in your brain that allows you to do that um, but yeah I'm desensitised to it but I, I definitely enjoy that documentary um, yeah it's weird like, everyone used to say like oh you know you're fight, like like a lot of people would ask me that, um, and they assume that it wouldn't be the case. They're like, did you get scared before you used to, you used to fight? That was the one, like, you used to get scared. Or, and I, I, I used to shit myself before fights. <laughs> like, I, 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 I was completely fine all through training camp, albeit like almost like, like obsessed, right? So every, as soon as you like, you just doing your normal training, normal training, normal training, bang, you book a fight. And then it's just like, I can't think of anything else. All I can think about is the fight, like my opponent, like what I'm doing with my training. All of a sudden, your whole life becomes like, because mm -hmm. oh, 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 at the end of it, you have to go and fight someone. Like, it's not like, and I even get a little bit like that around like training in general, but nowhere near to the, to the level you would when you've when you got, got a fight coming up. Because you're going to go and fight this person who you don't really know their, their skill sets. You, can, you know, you know what you've, you've seen. Um, like shown publicly like in competition so you know that people know much more than what's been shown right? because you're fighting against another skilled opponent so they you can't do everything that you would do in the gym against a skilled opponent you're you're having to gauge what their skills are on the move whilst you're doing it right so these fighters are obviously much more skilled than what you could see when you, when you, when you watch them fight but I used to be fine throughout training albeit very obsessed fine up into the weigh-in blah, blah blah I'd get to the day of the fight I'd turn up to the arena and I'd be like, what the fuck am I doing? Like, this makes no sense whatsoever. Like, I start thinking, Dale, you could do anything other than go and fight some, some other good guy that's been trained to fight, some another young, athletic, powerful person that's been that's training day in, day out to, to beat someone like that. I was like, I started thinking to myself, what the hell are you doing? Like, it's just, it's just ridiculous. This is not normal behavior anyway. I get super nervous. I do the warm up and stuff and like, Anxiety, and like real anxiety, like before the fight, like, you, like to, to the fact, the point you're like, warming up, and you're getting out of breath, throwing a few punches, like your adrenaline's so high, you're getting out of breath, and you're just like, and you're trying, trying to like control it and breathe, and the coach is like, come on, relax now, and you kind of get into it, and then my my sort of nerves and stuff used to peak, like you kind of like the my the, the last probably four or five fights were all filmed and like televised all that type of stuff so you'd be like behind the curtain ready to make the walk and you mute music and you'd be waiting there for like a couple of minutes before before you kind of make the walk and it's all like camera in your face sort of thing you're walking up um i remember being in, like that that is the moment where i was like fuck this is real like i'm going i'm going to go and fight someone like you know, this is, and you kind of feel like, oh, is there any way to me, me to go like run out the arena sort of thing? And like, but it's just something that keeps you there. Like, you know, I'm going to go and I'm going to go and do this anyway. And you make the walk nerve wracking, Vaseline on. 
get into the cage, lock the door. Just you, the, your opponent, the referee. Thousands of people around you in the arena. But at that moment, it's like none of it's like, you're not computing any of it. You can just see the opponent and the ref. And then you just like peak nerves and then bang. When the, when the, when the bell goes, as soon as the first punch is thrown, nerves are gone. There are no nerves anymore because you're fighting, right? You're in the you're in the situation now. You, now you have to. At this point, you you can't. There's no option to flee, right? There's no option to to leave or anything like that. You have to you have to deal with what's in front of you, and you, you and you just it just goes away. It becomes very much like, oh no, I do this in training. This is kind of what this is what I do every day in training. We beat each other up. This is kind of, and it becomes quite normal. But it's that build up because bear in mind, MMA is not. It's not like you haven't got shin guards. You've got tiny little gloves on. You can elbow each other, knee each other, punch, kick, submissions, grapples, wrestling, throw each other. It's like the rules allow for a real diverse amount of fighting to happen, right? So, you know, you, you, can, you, you know for a fact you, can, you could be getting elbowed in the head, in the head. In fact, I had... Both my two front teeth knocked out in the MMA fight. Like I threw an overhand right, and as I dug down, the guy jumped up with a knee, and it smashed me straight in the mouth, knocked my two front teeth out. And I carried on fighting, but I was having to fight with my teeth swelling around my mouth. Um, other times, you know, in, in positions like you get cuts or you know whatever it is. Um, it's a it's a it's a mad game, um, but it's it's weird. It's kind of like it's very when you do it, when you train it a lot, you kind of get desensitized to all that. Um, it's only for me, it was just peak fight day where I'd feel all the, all the nerves and stuff. Yes, it's a bit different to my scenario because people ask me if I get nervous before doing a big charity stunt, whether it's like run the country or yeah. what I did four Iron Men in one go once, which is quite interesting. Epic. <laughs> Yeah, I did it with eight weeks training, though, having come last in my first ever triathlon. Wow. Um, which kind of, but the thing is, I always say to people, like, if you're running at, say, a half marathon, we don't need to be nervous because it's not hard until the second hour. So you, yeah. you, you may as well wait an hour to be nervous. Yeah. And then when that hour's done, you'll be so into it. You ain't even thinking about nerves. You're thinking about dying. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. So, but, but in your case, it's the complete opposite. The moment you step into that cage, bang, it, there could be something to be nervous about. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting, but it's like, cause I, I was like, a lot of people might be nervous throughout their whole camp, right? Like they start feeling those anxious and so I, I, I was I was lucky that I got it condensed into that period of time on the day the, um, rather than kind of like a prolonged anxiety nervousness throughout um, a lot of people and a lot of people need help the fighters need help with managing those nerves it's like sports psychologists um, are in good business with fighters 100 <laughs> percent it's a good good issue to be because it be, mm. it does really affect your performance even to the point where like, so, you, you know, they're in there, they're fighting, but if you're going to land a, a shot, you have to commit to landing it, right? And when people are a little bit unsure, they won't, they won't quite commit. So they're safe, but they're not effective, right? So it's, it's, one, of, it's one of those things that it's like, that holds people back and it affects their performance. So, um, but yeah, I mean, four Ironmans in one go, mate. <laughs> um, that, sounds, that sounds brutal. Yeah, it was one of them ones where I almost thought I bit a bit off more than I could chew. Yeah. And I started to feel a bit stupid, but then I just persevered and 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 I would say smashed it out. It ended up with a I for for, for the last day of my Ironman, I'd entered an ultra, hundred mm -hmm. mile, hundred mile ultra called the Robin Hood race in Sherwood Forest and to add insult to injury, I kept missing the signs and going the wrong way. So when I checked my tracker at the end of it, I'd actually run 108 miles. <laughs> I'd done eight miles in the wrong direction <laughs> after doing a, 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 a quadruple Ironman. So. Oh. But, uh, um, mate, what you went, 
I mean, you were a professional. That's that's a hell yeah. of an achievement. Yeah, I was. I mean, I was just it's just the way it works out. But I just, um, I just was. I, I worked. Obviously, I worked exceptionally hard to to be, to to get to that level. Like I, I put a lot of training hours and stuff. But I also had a. It was a sport that I was quite gifted at. I, I, I was. It's, it's contact sports are kind of it's it's physical one you need physical attributes now i come straight out of the core um i was very strong very fit right so i was able to wrap that up again to suit me for combat sports um another thing i was very disciplined in my training so i was able to train again you know just keep showing up to classes learning adapting blah blah blah. um was you know fortunate to be in high pressure situations in the armed forces there's a high pressure situations when you're in, when you have to make decisions quickly with sort of stuff and, and there's consequences to the decisions you make. Right. So, um, and, and, and I've always been quite, uh, so, and then there's a skill element and my skills just improved over time. First, and when I first started fighting, I was more physical than skillful. So I was able to get by, by just like, I was fit and strong and just like bully but you know, bully my way through it type thing because I was, I was, I was, I trained for years. Um, but then as the time goes goes on, you can't do that against skilled opponents. You they get found out pretty quickly. So my my skills got better and better and better. But where I, where I sort of where I had an advantage, I think, was that those things I spoke about the kind of the psychological attributes helped me. Um, but also I was, I'm quite like I'm very, I, I'm not methodical. I'm kind of like. I've got like a, my brain's good at understanding like kind of decision-making processes and stuff. Like I just feel like I could almost outsmart them a little bit. Mm. Like, like, they're like fight, my fight IQ was high relative to my skill set, I would say. So I was, I was more intelligent with my fighting and like I'd use what would work well for me. I could kind of identify areas in the opponent that I could exploit type, type thing rather than being, I would say that actually probably 90 pretty much most of the people I fought or in fact all of them all of them would have been much more experienced than me all of them probably had a bigger range of skills than me when I was fighting um, they probably had more of that but I was just able to to use the ones that I knew would work better against them I think I'd be, I was, and I was able to I was able to do that before fight before fighting them sort of look at them and see what they what kind of they had and then also in there as well on, on the move, like I'd be, I'd, I was quite good at identifying like patterns and seeing like what things, how they would respond to certain things, and then making adaptions. So I think that that's what helped me more than anything. And then my skills are just improving alongside that. But once again, you, the, you know, as you go up, the level of skills are improving anyway for everyone else. So yeah, it was good. I mean, the fact you know, I, I was it was great to have a professional career in, in a sport. Like I never. At school, I was average, average athlete. So I, I'd never, I never thought that I'd ever. I couldn't. No, that's that's even just saying it. Right, I, I competed. I used to be a professional athlete. Right, that sounds that coming out of my mouth. That sounds strange, um, because I was never a professional athlete as, at, at, at school. I just, I just, it's just developed over time. I, I mean, and it's all, it's, it's the, it probably, it's probably just the cross the the kind of not a crossover, but the accumulation of training over years and years and years that has allowed me to, to, to be able to do that physically at that period of time. Um, and I was quite, I always liked com- combat anyway. Like I was, when I was a kid, you, you know, you probably struggled to find a picture when I wasn't like this. Um, <laughs> I, I just loved like human ninja, Tur- human uh, teenage mutant ninja turtles. I love like Thundercats and like even when, and then just anything that was like, where there was like fighting involved, it was just like action. It was just superheroes, all that type of stuff. I love, I, I love that. Um, so you know, when I got to do it, real, real life, real life, doing, I, I, I enjoyed it and it was fun. But um, and like I said, I got to fight in some good, big things and big shows and fight against some really good opponents and you know, fought on Sky Sports and Channel Five and all this type of stuff. Which is once again, like, I'm removed from it now. I'm doing triathlon. I'm, I'm, I'm a dad bod uh, doing doing uh, long course triathlon right now, so 
um, it's a completely different situation, but it's, uh, it's cool to look back at. Mate, let's come on to that. Incidentally, I'm going to send you a box set of the, of the $6 billion man. Six, yeah. six billion, six million, six million. We were so poor back in the seventies. It was yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, six million dollar man. If you like a good bloody fight, you missed out on that because you're too young. <laughs> we had six six million dollar man, and then he went. Uh, um, it was Lee Lee Majors starred in it. It was this astronaut dude that got blown up on the launch pad or something, or or landing from space, and they said, "We have the power." to rebuild him. He's Steve Austin, the $6 million man. And he, he had a bionic eye, a bionic arm, and bionic legs. <laughs> so, anyway, um, what was I going to say? Uh, what, what was your sort of grandest title? It, did, what, what did you win? I mean, in- oh, I, I won a, in mixed martial arts. I fought for the, I, I, won, I won a British title um, professionally. I um, also fought for the the Bama title, which was a which was a big um, big belt. I lost to a guy called uh, Stevie Ray, who went on to have like you know fifteen fights or so in the UFC. So I mean, and that we went to decisions. That was kind of like my biggest fight. I fought some big guys on cage rows and stuff. I mean, I was like I was ranked in Europe, ranked in the UK. Like we we, we it was we were at a good level, very good level. Um, I could have took the career further, but, you know, I believe, but injury and then it just just didn't just didn't happen to go that way and like I said I've never really if you circle back like I like to do different things I never really had long-term goals like it was never it was never my dream to be a professional fighter I just happened to go with the journey that it took me on and then you know when that journey came to an end you know injury and then I kind of moved on my life set up business and stuff that was just you know moving on to the next stage of something else right and now I now I get to work with fighters in a different capacity and I get to do other physical stuff that challenges me. Um, so like for me at the moment, Ironman's about just like pushing my boundaries and like seeing sort of seeing what I've, what I've got in me at the moment. And just, I just want to feel like I want to feel that, that hard, that hardship when I'm, when I'm training and when I'm, when I'm competing, I want to feel like the, the point where I want to quit. I want to be at that point. Um, and I want to feel like how do I how do I get through? I want to I want to kind of just experience it. Like how do I get? How do I navigate? It? How do I push through it? And so I'm, I just I feel like that's it's always been in me to want want to feel that. And it's just it's kind of you get to. I feel like by doing stuff like that, you really get to know yourself. Mm. It's a shame I didn't know you back in your fighting career because I would have taught you the ultimate trick oh, in the fight. Tell me. Uh, double punch, mate. Double punch. Yeah, or if you're French, the uh, double punché. Double punché. Like like this. What? Yeah. Do you know what? My my, I was um, I was holding my hands up to my daughter earlier, and she was doing the double punché. She knows so, it. She knows it. I didn't even teach her it, mate. She she's was- going a long way. She, she's obviously heard my reputation. Yeah, I, I mean, she has. She's been on Instagram and YouTube a little bit, so maybe it's, it's something, something to do with that. Yeah, mind you, the 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 other side of the coin is if you need to avoid the double punch, you just turn sideways quickly. Turn sideways. I mean, that's <laughs> how you avoid any punch, actually. <laughs> Triathlon, the, the the word that sinks fear into the heart of every man and woman. How did that come about? I needed something to um, get me motivated again in terms of training after um, having my children because I'm kind of training sort of fell off, um, fell off course. It wasn't where it wasn't where it needed to be. Um, I was feeling a bit shitty about myself and putting on weight and energy was low and stuff like that. So yeah, I just decided to book an Ironman. I was like, let's, let's, let's get stuck into this and see what this sport's about. How's how's you swimming? Swimming, um, it's, it's one of the ones I was just like, you know. I, I, I do a lot of swimming because I was crap at it. So it's just, I have to do a lot of it and I'm slowly improving, getting better. Like I'm, I'll be, I'm much better equipped to swim this year than I was last year, for instance, but I'm still pretty crap. Um, but I only sort of started realizing recently that actually it's important to get out the water in a good position rather than like just thinking, oh, I'm just going to rely on the bike to kind of pull me through. 
if you get out of it, like last year, I end up like getting like 400 places on the bike um, because I was that far back <laughs> getting out of the water. Um, you just make things hard for yourself. So um, this year, I'm um, hopefully come out in the water, hopefully a little bit further ahead in the field. And then that makes things a little bit easier. Maybe the weather conditions a bit better this year. We'll see. Do you, are you naturally buoyant? No. I'm guessing no, no. No, I sink bad, real, real badly. I can't, I can't sort of like lie in the water and float. No. Um, my, my wife makes me laugh. She's like, for years on holiday and stuff, she'd be like, um, she's like, like everyone, she's, she's just, her thing was, everyone can float. If she lies in the water, she can just float. She's like, everyone can float. Humans can float. I was like, Debbie, I can't float. She goes, you can, you're just not relaxing. I was like, I'm relaxed. Like my legs are sinking. I'm going to drown if I just like carry on with this. Yeah, she, she was adamant, but I definitely don't. I, I'm not buoyant at all. I, I sink to the bottom. I need to keep my legs moving if I'm going to, uh, uh, otherwise my legs will just drag along. But being in a wetsuit helps me significantly. Yeah, I've got a zone three, mate. It's like having a life jacket on it. Just keeps your head above water. Is it good, is it? Yeah, it's really... the um, fr- Friends at home, triathlon wetsuit is specifically designed so that the fabric on the arms is something ridiculous, like one mil. It's too, it's too rubbish. If you're in cold water, you, you yeah, start yeah. shivering your ass off. Yeah. But on your front and on your back and on your legs, it's five mil. And that in itself means you don't even have to swim. It, it you, you you bob, you bob oh, wow. about, you bob about there. Um, but I remember in the, in the Marines, my swimming test, where you jump off the diving board, you've got your kit on, you've got a rifle, you've got to swim down a pool, swim back, hand it all off to someone without touching the side. That was my hardest. That was actually harder than an endurance course for me. That I, I didn't pass it until the fortnight of the. Uh, passing out parade yeah i was all right i could do like i could do the breaststroke i found out like i was pretty strong with that but i don't know what it was like i had a couple of experiences when i was younger where like i almost not almost drowned but i thought like i was i felt like i was going to drown like i had to be dragged out of the water once uh, when i was a young kid and there's something about like having my face in the water would i didn't feel like i was panicked but my breath told me something completely different, right? So I'd get super out of breath really, really quickly if my face was in the water, as opposed to being out of the water. The breaststroke was okay because you dip it in and out. But when I started doing front crawl, I just, just it's almost like the, the downward facing, looking towards the floor, the, the bottom sort of caused some sort of panic response. But over time, I got used to it. In fact, even last year in a triathlon, it was a mass start. It was only probably about 300 or 400 racing, but in a mass start, like for some reason, I positioned myself right in the middle. I don't know why. Like, shouldn't it be in the middle? I should be off to the flank a little bit for the start and then sort of get tucked in, in the middle of the thick, in the thick of things. Crappy swimmer. Everyone starts belting along. And I'm like, yeah, let's just go, let's go. We're racing. And then all of a sudden, I'm like, this is a, it was just like chaos couldn't see anything and I just started like I swallowed some water and, all, and then I start panicking right so I'm like fuck like the, and then and, I, and then I and the worst thing you can do anyone knows if you're in that sort of situation is stop swimming because everyone just swims over you right like everyone's there's this mass crowd of people so anyway I start stop coming up I'm looking around like I'm, I'm like they obviously got goggles on you're looking around there's lots of people splashing and then everyone starts swimming over me and I'm like oh, I'm getting pulled under the water Literally, um, and I, I bore the line, had to like take myself off to the plank and get out of the water type thing. But I managed to, I managed to like, like breathe a little bit and it was like, okay, and just a little bit of fast breath stroking. And I managed to get my breath back, but I was, I was, I was danger close to just, just pulling out, right? Like massive panic response from like the swallow in the water and then people swimming over me. I know better now, like next time, just like keep swimming a little bit. <laughs> just don't get crushed by everyone else. Um, but yeah, what, swimming is not not my um, it's not much better than what it was. But it's just not. It's just I don't know. It's just not naturally naturally a swimmer. I was like forty seven, I think, and I, I realised that I couldn't swim. Obviously, you know, I swim a bit because you you got to be able to swim to be in the Marines. But when it come to front crawl, I could do like a length, and that was, and it all went to rat shit. 
So I signed up for my local swimming pool and I thought, right, I'm going to do an Ironman. That's it. And I'm going to learn. And I just watch YouTube videos and slowly, little by little, I did one length and I did two, then I did 10. Then I started to do hun- hundreds of, you know, like 80 lengths or something. Yeah. The two things for anybody listening, I would highly recommend is if you do have a problem with buoyancy and you're training for a triathlon is you can buy buoyancy shorts yeah, yeah. and they're neoprene shorts and they just keep your core up a bit. And it's not, it's not a cheat or anything because you're obviously allowed to wear a wetsuit for, for an Ironman. So, and the other thing, Dale is I'll wear the goggles that, that go all the way across your eyes, almost like a, a, a diving mask, but without the nose. Yeah. Bit. And, they're wicked. You know, you get so, a re- you get a perfect seal. Yeah. Do you, you know what? I've, I've started thinking about it recently because sometimes if, like, I've got I've got these like magic fives, right? They're like, have you seen them? They're kind of like shaped. They're, they're quite small goggles. Yeah. They're like they they you, you scan your face and they shake them. I'm just not. I'm don't get on with them at all. Like, I'm, like, like them big them the the ones that are kind of more like cyclops style. I just feel like your vision will be so much better in them. Like in, in, in the open water, like I was swimming the other day, I went to a lake and I was just swimming and, I was, and it wasn't even busy. And I was just like, I was trying to sight. I was like, I can't see anything. Like, I, I'm like, I don't even know what direction I'm swimming in really. I've only got like, could go off little bits that I can see. I'm broadly swimming in the right direction. Because the lake was wide, I was like, wasn't sure whether I was meandering or what I was doing because the boys were tiny. You couldn't hardly see them anyway. Plus, like the goggles are sort of tight to your face. They don't give you that much. I felt they weren't. They don't give me that much vision. So, I don't, I'm, and so I've struck, I'm, I don't know. I'm just kind of considering changing because at the minute it's just like. But I mean, it's not. Maybe it won't matter next week. I'm just going to get sort of tucked in behind someone and hope they're swimming in the right direction. Um, like, like there's like a mass. Op- so basically, this year, like last year, it was like you had to swim. It was swimming anti-clockwise. This year is the same lake, but swimming clockwise around the lake. That like, for me. I, I always breathe to the right. I don't breathe to the left when I'm swimming competitively because I'm just much more efficient right breathing. So when I'm practicing, I'll breathe both sides. But off, a, lot, a lot of the time, if I'm competing, I'll just breathe to one side because it's quicker. Um, but I'm, so because it's clockwise this year, <coughs> it's better for me because I can position myself slightly on slightly on the outside edge and I'll be able to see everyone in front of me. Whereas last year, it was anti-clockwise. Um, and... Like I couldn't see like sort of round the bend, sort of like, in, I, I, and I had to position myself right inside everyone, and then I was, and then being all slightly weaker swimmer, I was getting more kind of like caught up in bits that I didn't want to be in really because I had to position myself on the inside. But ne- this year I can position myself on the outside, so I think that that in itself will help me to swim faster this year. But mm. we'll see. Yeah, I use those goggles and I use the little fog spray yeah, stuff spray, yeah. yeah stops them mist and i've never had a problem with that uh, how, how many iron men have you done just one one last year yeah uh, and was that 12 hours did i see from the yeah i've done 12, 12 hours 35 seconds it was like a bit slower than what i would, would have wanted like it's hilly course iron man uk which is fine like, but I, I kind of I could have got, you know, if, if I'd have had a good day, I could have got a lot better. But the whole field was slowed down, to be honest, because the weather was atrocious. Like the the the, the weather on the bike was like biblical rain. It, like it rained for four hours straight. And Ironman UK is like really like loads of steep climbing up and down. Um, so it made the bike course really treacherous, and people were coming off, and it was dangerous. So people had like, we had to slow down basically. So um, and it also battered people's legs. It just made it much harder work on the bike. Um, but you know, I've done, done pretty good in the field overall, and it was for my first effort, it was good. But I'd like to definitely see an improvement on that this year. Um, but we'll see. But Chris, mate, I literally have to go in two minutes, man. Yeah, no I'm worries, mate. You off. I was just gonna say, you did 12, 12 hours 35. I, I would probably have done that in 12 34. I'm I reckon I reckon you could have done it in just 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 under 12 mate given yeah. your uh, pedigree probably could have done it an hour mate but that's showing off and yeah yeah and no, I mean you don't want to you don't want to upstage the professionals it just wouldn't, it wouldn't be right <laughs> Dale it's been absolutely fascinating mate thank you so much for coming on the show 
Eight yeah, yeah it's uh i haven't done so much of the fighting bit i'll leave that to my, my little boy but um he does his taekwondo he's uh almost a black belt now which i'm very very he's seven years old it's it's, right. it's a junior black belt but <clears throat> very very proud of him um but yeah we have uh we've a lot of parallels in our in, in our life and it's great great to chat yeah, about so um uh, just stay on the line so I can thank you properly. But uh, Dale, thank you ever so much. I will put your Instagram below so people can uh, jump on that and uh, strongly suggest folks, even if this is an inkling in your mind that maybe you want to do this one day or something, just follow someone like Dale and just, just get started. You know, you, you can do a triathlon in a day. If you set yourself a run around the block, cycle up to the shop and back, and then just go to your swimming pool and swim a, five lengths boom it it's it it's a great way to get into this sort of stuff um but yes <clears throat> losing my voice now Dale, massive thanks brother to everybody at home big love to you all if you could please like and subscribe i hope you've enjoyed this as much as i have and uh we'll see you next time thank you very much